How close are we actually to recreating Jurassic Park in real life? Are the movie's dinosaurs very accurate? Like, how big did the Mosasaurus really get, for example? And as a bonus, were there any dinosaurs that actually lived in cold, snowy climates like we see in the trailer for Jurassic World Dominion? These are all questions we're going to address in this video. Welcome back to the Majestic Mashikasaurus YouTube channel. Holy guacamole, it has been a long time. I haven't posted on here in over a year, which is totally nuts, but I haven't been doing nothing. In that time, I've been making TikTok videos, and apparently they're pretty good since in just over a year, I've amassed over 20 million video views and 300,000 followers, which is also nuts. So if you're here from TikTok, thank you so much for hopping on over. If you enjoy the debunking bad science style of videos, well, that's how I got started in science communication here on YouTube. So you may enjoy perusing my old videos. And if you're an OG YouTube subscriber, thanks so much for still being here. I have some good stuff for you today and plans for more on the way. In this video, in celebration of the new Jurassic World movie that just came out, I've compiled six of my TikToks that each have something to do with Jurassic Park. In the first, I respond to another TikTok video I saw where some people were making the claim that we're really close to recreating Jurassic Park in real life, and I evaluate that claim. In the second, I go on a hunt through the actual scientific literature to find out how big we think the Mosasaurs really got, because this, spoiler alert, is too big. Then I'll spend a video talking about Jurassic Park's iconic version of Dilophosaurus. How much of this is reality and how much is invented? Next, we'll briefly talk about the time periods themselves. You probably know that the Jurassic is one of only three of the time periods during which the dinosaurs ruled the Earth, but what was the difference between the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, and what were the dinosaurs up to in each of them? The fifth video is dedicated to one of my favorite dinosaurs because it's just so bizarre, and because I was so excited to see it pop up in the trailer for Jurassic World Dominion, it's worth talking about here what we actually know about it. And finally, also from the trailer, we see some dinosaurs living somewhere snowy and cold, but were there actually dinosaurs that lived in the Arctic? Well, you'll find out in that last video, and then afterward, I'm going to give you guys here on YouTube an extra tidbit on that topic that TikTok didn't get, so stick around for that. So with all that said, let's get into the first video. But if I told you dinosaurs are coming back, what whoa, do you whoa, mean whoa, hold on. Back? I know I'm a little late to this video, but I can't help it. I just must respond. So earlier this year, there was a fossil of a dinosaur that was found, but this fossil was completely different than all the other ones that were found because there was dinosaur DNA found on it. All right, hold on. I appreciate you citing your source, but hints of fossil DNA? That's your first red flag right there. Hints is not going to get you Jurassic Park. What can they really do with that, though? Great question. Here's an idea. Let's actually read that article you cited and see what they have to say about it. Does the discovery mean we can sequence dino DNA? Not even close. Great. Okay. Okay. Plus, we don't even know whether the material is unaltered DNA or some kind of fossil byproduct of genetic material breaking down. Scientists also caution that if DNA is present within the dinosaur cells, it's probably in tiny fragments chemically altered and tangled up with what was once protein. We're not doing the Jurassic Park thing. Did you guys even read the article you cited? So it's been proven throughout the years that we've been able to successfully clone 33 different kinds of animals, like monkeys, dogs, and horses. Yeah, I think that's correct. They have even talked about trying to bring back a woolly mammoth, and those have been extinct for over 10,000 years. Look, I know 10,000 years seems like a long time ago, but the last non avian dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago. There is an enormous difference between 10,000 and 70 million. But all they need is the DNA. Well, that makes it sound way simpler than it is. There's a lot to be said here, but here's just a couple of highlights to give you an idea of how good the DNA remains from a mammoth are and still how incredibly far away we are from doing anything substantial with it. If you're going to clone a mammoth, you need something to birth it, for example. It can't just pop into existence. So we find the closest related living animal, an elephant, and then step one is identifying all the places along the DNA sequence of a mammoth and the DNA sequence of an elephant that are different. Then you go through the genetic material in an elephant embryo and change all the spots where the elephant and mammoth's DNA differ so that now in those spots it has the information that codes for a mammoth instead of the information that codes for elephant. So after all of that you have the DNA information for a mammoth inside an elephant embryo which you can then put back into a female elephant where it will develop and be born. Now here's the problem. There's about one and a half million differences between the genome of an elephant and the genome of a mammoth and so far we've identified oh about 50 and I'm pretty sure the genetic code for elephants and mammoths is way closer than like between a t-rex and an ostrich or something so there would be a lot more work to be done in that case than compared to trying to clone a mammoth and all of this hinges on having a hundred percent of the genetic code in the first place and we're nowhere even remotely close to that with the dinosaur do you think they can actually turn it into an actual dinosaur well there's a theory that we're actually going to be able to successfully create and clone a dinosaur from the dna that was found on that fossil yeah i feel like i've pretty well shown why that's not true in the next part they point out that one of elon musk's friends thinks it's possible and frankly he can say whatever he wants but it doesn't actually mean anything Plus, the kind of thing that he tweeted about is not the same as what these guys are discussing, so whatever. Disneyland's gonna have some competition. Well, not anytime soon. Probably Disney would just buy it and add it to one of their own parks anyway, right? Next up, how big did the Mosasaurs actually get? Here's me on a hunt to find out. 
In a previous video, I said this. I talk about the largest land dwelling lizard that ever lived. And then I talked about a 20 foot long extinct relative of the Komodo dragon. But notice I said it was the largest land dwelling lizard that ever lived. Well, it was nothing compared to its cousins that lived in the water. First of all, what do I even mean when I say lizards? Like, are dinosaurs lizards? No, just like crocodiles, they're reptiles, but not lizards. You may have also seen these ancient crazy sea monsters. Not dinosaurs, yes, reptiles, but also not lizards. There was, however, an ancient lineage of legit lizards that evolved to go back to living in the water. Their earliest relatives show up about 95 million years ago and they look like this. They are semi-aquatic critters called Aegialosaurids. But over the next 20 million years, they got more streamlined, changed their feet to flippers, totally adapted to life in the oceans, and they got huge. That's right, these were the Mosasaurs. And the reason I didn't say that to begin with is because most people don't realize that Mosasaurs are not as closely related to dinosaurs or even other prehistoric marine reptiles as they are to modern-day lizards. Basically like giant swimming Komodo dragons or something, they were legitimately giant sea lizards. Now, the Jurassic World Mosasaur is way too big, but how big did they actually get? Well, come fall down at Wikipedia and Google Scholar rabbit hole with me to find out. Figuring out size of the absolute largest mosasaurs basically comes down to extrapolating body length from skull size. This 1967 book posits that the skull to body length ratio is 1 to 10, and that puts the largest mosasaurs at over 50 feet long. Now obviously I don't have this book so I don't know where he got that 1 to 10 ratio from, but Wikipedia says that no explicit justification was provided. But I found this 2014 article that said the head was probably closer to 1 7th the length of the full body based off a smaller mosasaur that had a more complete skeleton. That would give a length for the larger species of 36 feet or longer. Now I'd like to find some other recent sources to see what other experts think, right? And I found that the fifth triennial Mosasaur meeting from 2016 had a section called How Big Did They Really Get? And here they say that the largest exceeded 15 meters in length, which is a lot like the 1967 length. So are they using the 1 to 10 ratio? I don't know, they don't say. They also say there's a specimen 17.6 meters long and another one that's close to 18. Where are they getting those numbers? I don't know, they don't say. They say there's a specimen from Russia that's also in the 17 meter range. How are they getting that? I don't know, but they do cite a source for this one. So I was able to use their reference, throw it into Google Scholar, find the actual paper, then scroll through 20 pages just to see at the very end it says, thus the total length of the animal should be approximately 17 meters using Russell's 1967 length of the jaws equal to 10% of the overall body length. Okay, but guys, we need a justification for using this arbitrary ratio from 50 years ago. Just look somewhere new, I went to the Wikipedia page for Tylosaurus, one of the largest mosasaurs, and found that one of the current leading experts says that they got 43 to 46 feet long, which is kind of somewhere in the middle. How did he get those numbers? Unfortunately, I don't know because I don't have the book. I'd love to read it though. So if someone asked me how big were the largest mosasaurs and they didn't want any explanation, I would say almost 40 feet long. And if I heard anyone give a number over 45, I would be skeptical until I heard further supporting information. But y'all, 40 feet is that gray one. Can you even imagine swimming with that? Imagine how big that giant carnivorous sea lizard is compared to you. It's amazing. Plus, here's a quick YouTube exclusive for you guys. Michael Everhart, who is the author of that book I briefly mentioned, is one of the world's foremost experts on mosasaurs. And in that book, Oceans of Kansas, he apparently writes this, quote, it would be possible for some extremely old Tylosaurus individuals, Tylosaurus is one of the largest types of mosasaurs, to reach 20 meters or 66 feet in absolute maximum length. However, this is with the awareness that there is no, no fossil evidence suggesting such sizes and that the odds of preserving such a rare individual are far too great. In other words, like many reptiles today, perhaps they didn't stop or slow down growing so much as they got older. So if some special individual managed to get really old, it maybe could have also grown much larger than normal, up to 20 meters or 66 feet in length. And perhaps, yeah, it's just a little bit of speculation, but that would be pretty cool. All right, in this next video, I'll be talking specifically about Dilophosaurus. Let's go. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Dilophosaurus, which a lot of you will probably think you're already familiar with. And honestly, a lot of you probably are in fact familiar with Dilophosaurus, but I'd like to talk about how not only is Jurassic Park's reconstruction of this dinosaur not just inaccurate, but also impossible. <laughs> But hey, let's start with what they got right. Dilophosaurus is indeed a bipedal carnivore. Walks on two legs, it's got a tail, sharp teeth, two arms, eats meat. They got the basics. Also, the name Dilophosaurus means double-crested lizard because one of its characteristic traits is those two large crests running along the top of its head, which they also got right. So where did Jurassic Park go wrong? Well, the first is a little pet peeve of mine that you'll notice in a lot of popular reconstructions of dinosaurs, which is notice how the back of the hands and fingers are facing forward. Well, for any dinosaur to be walking around with its hands like this, its wrists would have had to have been very much broken. <laughs> In reality, the back of the hands would have been facing outward like this. They also did not give it its characteristic kink in the upper jaw. They also made it too small, which is pretty surprising. Basically, even though Dilophosaurus was actually about 20 to 23 feet long in real life, they didn't want it to be confused with the Velociraptors that they already made way too big, so they had to make Dilophosaurus a lot smaller. But of course, those are pretty minor points. The big ones are the neck frill and the ability to spit venom, neither of which there is any evidence for. You'd be able to tell based on skull anatomy if the animal had a frill, and the venom spitting is the reason I think this reconstruction of Dilophosaurus is actually 
impossible. Let's look at a real life venom spitting animal like a cobra. Notice how the venom is a liquid. It's like the consistency of water or something. Remember that the Dilophosaurus venom, however, is thick and sticky. The reason this wouldn't work is that because animals that do spit venom, like a cobra, do it by having a little sack full of the venom and then tubes leading out through the mouth or the teeth. And by squeezing that sack, you force the liquid to spray out. Trying to spit a thick mucusy venom to me seems like trying to put molasses in a water spray bottle. Like it's not gonna work the same way. So with all that being said, I love Jurassic Park, but this is more like what the real Dilophosaurus would have looked like. And the animal Jurassic Park created is indeed super cool, but I think this is one of those cases where real life, pretty damn cool already. In our next video, let's talk about the time periods themselves, not just the Jurassic, but also the Triassic and Cretaceous. What was the difference between them and how did the dinosaurs change from one to the other? Let's find out. What if I told you there's more time separating Stegosaurus from T-Rex than there is between T-Rex and us? Because that's 100% true. Because yes, we do split up the time of the dinosaurs into multiple periods, and they were all very long. The 186 million year long era that is most often referred to as the time of the dinosaurs is called the Mesozoic Era, which means middle life. Why? Well, because the era before it was called the Paleozoic, which means ancient life, and the one after it, which we're still living in, is called the Cenozoic, which means recent life. Isn't it just the best when scientific names for things actually make sense? Oh, love it. And within the Mesozoic, there are three periods you're probably familiar with, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous. The Triassic had a bit of a rough start, though, considering that the period right before it, the Permian, ended with, and get this, the end Permian mass extinction. Ah, oh, makes sense. Love it. And this was the worst mass extinction event in all of Earth's history. It spelled doom for 81% of all marine species and 70% of all land-dwelling species, which is a lot. It was so bad that it's often referred to as the Great Dying which is maybe overdramatic, but we love a little bit of flair, so why not? <laughs> but the good news is that in the late Triassic, the first dinosaurs appear, so that's fun. But in the Triassic, they are not the ruling reptiles. There are still a bunch of other bigger, weirder reptiles that are in charge. So in the Triassic, dinosaurs shared the Earth. But 251 million years ago, the Triassic ended with, and get this, the end Triassic mass extinction. Again, makes sense. Love it. And the important point here is that most of the dinosaurs' competitions succumbed to extinction at this point, which meant that in the Jurassic, the dinosaurs officially took over. They got big. They got everywhere and they finally became the dominant group of animals on the land. In the Jurassic, the dinosaurs hogged the earth. But then 145 million years ago, the Jurassic ended with... nothing? Really? As I was scripting this video, I realized I don't really know how we define the Jurassic to Cretaceous boundary, so I looked it up. The end of the Jurassic, however, has no clear boundary with the Cretaceous and is the only boundary between geologic periods to remain formally undefined. So it's just kind of arbitrary. The Jurassic ended basically because we felt like it. Why? We were doing so well! But it's the Cretaceous now, and dinosaurs are still very much the dominant life on land. The only difference is they've been doing it for tens of millions more years. And when you multiply evolution, which is just slow accumulation of small changes over time, by a lot of time, you get more diversity, more variation, more uniqueness, more craziness. So in the Cretaceous, dinosaurs get more diverse and wacky than ever before, producing some of the most famous, like T-Rex, Triceratops, and Ankylosaurus, and some of the most bizarre, like Therizinosaurus, Nigerosaurus, Spinosaurus, Cosmoceratops, Gigantoraptor, and a group called the Neorniths, aka modern birds. And then the Cretaceous ends around 66 million years ago, largely thanks to an enormous space rock smashing into the Gulf of Mexico and causing, get this, the end Cretaceous mass extinction. Okay, we're back, thank goodness. And that, of course, wiped out all of the dinosaurs except for one group of small feathery ones, the birds, which means that technically dinosaurs are some of the most successful animals even today. In summary, as my paleobiology professor likes to say, in the Triassic, dinosaurs shared the earth. In the Jurassic, dinosaurs hogged the earth. And in the Cretaceous, dinosaurs get fancy. Thank you, Dr. Ritterbush. In this fifth video, let's talk about one of the oddest of dinosaurs, which you can see briefly in the Jurassic World Dominion trailer here and here. But what is that? And what do we actually know about it? Well. Here you go. What if I told you there was a dinosaur with claws almost the length of your arm? Well, today I'd like to introduce you to one of the oddest of dinosaurs and one of my personal favorites, Therizinosaurus. And before I even show you a picture of what this bizarre creature looked like, you have to admit that it already has an amazing name going for it. I mean, Therizinosaurus, super fun to say, sounds great, it looks cool, and it means scythe lizard, which is awesome, and given the really long and curved claws it has, is totally perfect. Anyway, without further ado, I present Therizinosaurus. <laughs> 
I chose this image because it clearly shows off many of this beast's key features. It is a bipedal, pot-bellied dinosaur with a long neck, small head, and arms, hands, and claws like almost no other. However, this image is probably missing something because a very closely related and smaller cousin to Therizinosaurus, called Bipiosaurus, was known to have had feathers, which means Therizinosaurus might have also, making this potentially a bit more accurate. And you'd probably guess that a 30-foot long animal with claws like that would have had to have been the top predator of its ancient Mongolian environment. And that's also a good assumption given that it's in the same large group of dinosaurs that includes all of the carnivorous ones. Although, fun fact, when its claws were first found, they were thought to be the ribs of a giant turtle. But no, for a number of reasons, including the shape of its teeth, we know Therizinosaurus was a plant eater and probably used those claws to hook and pull vegetation closer within reach. But obviously they would have also been super intimidating to predators. Oh, and one more thing. Based on the lifestyles of other unrelated animals, but with similar-ish body plans, one pair of researchers suggested that Therizinosaurus and its close relatives like Erlionsaurus that I'm about to show you a picture of, could have foraged while sitting down, which is just the best thing I've ever seen. And even though Therizinosaurus is an Asian dinosaur, it had a couple smaller relatives, Falcarius and Nothronychus, from North America. So if you'd like to see their skeletons up close in real life, you can do that at the Natural History Museum of Utah. Along with, of course, the rest of the absolutely fantastic Past Worlds Gallery. Who knows, you might even run into me. Seriously, come and ask me questions so I have something interesting to do. <laughs> now, I don't actually work at the Natural History Museum of Utah anymore, so you're less likely to just run into me there, but you should definitely go still check out the museum, it's fantastic. But all right, my last TikTok video is one I'm actually posting today after this video comes out. So here it is coming to you on YouTube early. I just got back from seeing the new Jurassic World movie, so we'll have to talk about that sometime soon. But for now, the trailer has this scene in it, a feathered raptor living somewhere snowy and cold, and that raises the question, were there actually dinosaurs that lived in conditions like this? Well, there's actually been some pretty amazing recent dinosaur discoveries from Alaska. For example, in 2007 near Denali National Park, there were some amazing and extensive trackways discovered, some footprints so perfectly preserved that they actually have scaly feet skin impressions. Two thirds of the footprints from that particular trackway are from some kind of duck-billed dinosaur, so something like this and there's both adult and baby footprints and that suggests that these were family units that lived in the far north year-round we had previously thought maybe they migrated south to have and then raise their babies there before heading back up north but no apparently they lived in the arctic all year plus there's relatively not that many of the smaller tracks which means that the juveniles probably grew up pretty quickly and these duck bills were not alone we've actually found fossils and footprints from a surprising amount and diversity of dinosaurs from alaska which means they were both widespread and quite successful there for example there's fossils of pachyrhinosaurus a relative of triceratops Fossils of Nanuxaurus, a smaller relative of Tyrannosaurus. Fossils of Alaska Cephali, a genus of the dome-headed dinosaurs like Pachycephalosaurus. Footprints of some kind of very large pterosaur, the flying cousins of the dinosaurs. And even footprints of some kind of Therizinosaur. We don't have the fossils yet, but it would have been something like its relatives. Truly odd herbivores with long necks, small heads, and enormous arms and claws. But the Cretaceous Arctic was very much different than it is today. So here's a quick paragraph to take you back to that ancient world. Here we go. 70 million years ago, Alaska was warmer than today, with an average temperature of perhaps 6 degrees Celsius, which is about 43 degrees Fahrenheit, and a climate comparable to modern-day U.S. Pacific Northwest. The big limitation for plants and animals then wasn't the cold, but the three to four months of winter darkness. There were vast polar forests here then, an ecosystem with no modern equivalent. During the winter months, plants and photosynthesis would shut down. Broad-leafed trees would lose their leaves and conifers would drop their needles. For animals here in summer, the living was great, as trees and shrubs exploded with verdant foliage in the 24 hours of sunlight. But winter would have been a lean time. But it's even more brutal today. The average temperature now in Denali is about negative 2 degrees Celsius, or about 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which, as you'd probably imagine, makes doing paleontology there quite the experience. Erickson describes it as some of the most arduous dinosaur paleontology that could be done. The cold, rain, fog, and snow are just the start of it. The researchers also have to contend with ubiquitous biting insects and run the risk of encountering wolves and bears. Tents have been trampled by grizzlies, and with climate change, there's even a chance of running into a polar bear. The scariest thing is when the cliffs around the Colville River collapse with Without warning. Wow. Now, because this video didn't exist when I filmed that video, after I post this one, I'm gonna go film another clip for that video where I show this video being up on my channel. And the reason I tell you that is because in that clip that you didn't see, because it doesn't exist yet, after I tell people basically what this YouTube video is going to be about, I also say this. Plus, at the very end, I spend a minute talking about another Arctic dinosaur, a predator much bigger than its southern relatives, and why that might be. So go check it out. So, well, let's do that. 
We haven't found enough fossil material yet to potentially name or describe it as a new species, but there's been some teeth found in Alaska of some kind of truodontid, a group of small meat-eating dinosaurs with large toe claws. They're closely related to the dromaeosaurids, which are famous for their large curved toe claws, and they're sometimes called the raptor dinosaurs. What makes the teeth from this truodontid from Alaska special, though, is that they are about 50% larger than the remains of its relatives from the south, like from Montana, Alberta, and Texas. And the Alaskan truodontid also appears to be much more common. Also, one of the scientists who worked on the Denali trip said this, One of the things that makes truodon unique is that it has the largest eye orbit to body size ratio of any dinosaur. We argue that truodon was pre-adapted for the light conditions of the Arctic, which allowed it to be so abundant. In other words, these dinosaurs evolved very large eyes elsewhere for some other reason, but when a subpopulation of them moved north, where it's dark for a significant portion of the year, having those huge eyes was a huge benefit, which meant that in the south, while they were probably more rare there and outcompeted by other large carnivorous dinosaurs, in the north, they became dominant, and as a result, they could get much bigger. The large size of Trudon's eyes may have meant that in the Arctic it was able to outcompete other kinds of predator that were more common elsewhere. Fiorio, who's the scientist I quoted earlier, points out modern ecosystems where wolves and coyotes once coexisted, but the wolf has been removed. Quote, coyotes' response is that they grow bigger. The top predator is removed so they can expand into their niche space. There's a modern basis for saying that's what we're also seeing in Trudon. Pretty cool. Well, if you made it this far, thank you so much for sticking around. I hope I did a pretty good job making it worth it for you. I plan on making some more short compilations of my TikToks to put on here for y'all. Plus, I have something much bigger in the works that I've been working on for quite some time now and I'm very excited about. No promises yet on exactly how soon that will be out, but it's gonna be good. I'm very excited for it. So if you're not subscribed yet, why not do it? It's free, it helps me out, and you know, it's not like I'm posting super frequently at the moment, so I'm not gonna like be cramming up your subscriptions page or anything. Anyway, go ahead and like the video if you did indeed like it, and thanks again so much for watching. My name is Milo, or the Majestic Mashikasaurus, and remember, it's not magic, it's science. Boy, it feels good to say that again. Alright, I hope to see you again in another one soon. Peace out.